All right, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity in this country that we still, at this point, have freedom. We pray that we would continue to preach the gospel and ensure that people have the freedom to do so. As we look into this issue of politics, it's a very divisive issue for many. We pray we'd talk about it with truth and grace at the same time. And we thank you for the beacon that Calvary Chapel is here in the Lexington, Columbia area. In Christ's name, amen. Before I get into this, I want to introduce you to, and my name's Frank Turk, by the way, for those who weren't here this morning. Uh, we have a ministry called crossexamine.org, and the man who really makes that run is sitting right here. His name is Jorge Gill. Hey, Jorge, stand up if you would, right here. He... Uh, he lives in Colombia, originally from Costa Rica. He's an apologist himself, so if you have any, have any questions in Espanol, he's coming up. All right, and uh, he may join me up here for Q&A a little bit later. But we are talking about, does Jesus trump your politics? And I want to go all the way back to 2003 in the United States Senate. At the time, Sam Brownback here was a senator from the state of Kansas. He went on to be the governor of Kansas and also recently served in the State Department uh, as the head of religious freedom there. Anyway, in 2003, what Brownback did was he had a photo of a 21-week-old fetus he said had been spared abortion by doctors who operated in the womb to correct a birth defect. Here is the photo that he was showing in the United States Senate. Okay, this, as you can see, is the hand of the baby in the womb of the mother that doctors were operating on this baby to correct a birth defect. Here's a little bit more dramatic of a picture. As you can see. So, Senator Brownback asked this question. Is little Samuel's hand the hand of a person, or is it the hand of a piece of property? This young boy was born, and his name turned out to be Samuel, ironically. So he asked this question, and Senator Barbara Boxer, who was the senator from California at the time, said this. I am not a doctor, and I am not God. I trust other human beings to make these decisions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, question. Do you have to be a doctor or God to know that that's a human being? No. And when she says she trusts other human beings to make these decisions, why is she a United States Senator? Because what our elected representatives are supposed to do is make such decisions on behalf of us. And if she's saying she doesn't make those decisions, why is she there? She shouldn't be there. And she's not there now, quite obviously. You know who took her place? Someone by the name of Kamala Harris. Don't know if you've ever heard of her. In any event, you don't need to be a doctor or God to know that that's a baby in the womb. In fact, if she had read the Bible, the Bible would have told her the same thing. You know, a lot of people say, well, abortion's not talked about in the Bible. Well, technically it isn't. You're right. Why? Because number one, the Hebrews thought abortion was unthinkable. Because children are made in the image of God and they are a blessing. But secondly, thou shalt not murder covers that topic. The Bible doesn't talk about felony home invasion either. But thou shalt not steal covers that topic. It talks about the broad category, not the specific instances of all the time. However, the Bible is very clear as to what's in the womb. And probably the best piece of scripture for this is Luke chapter 1 and this is the story where Mary who has just been told she's pregnant with Jesus goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth who is six months pregnant with John the Baptist and most scholars say that the relation here is that Jesus and John the Baptist are cousins and here's what happens when Mary goes to see Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the choice, 
the fetus, the blob of tissue, the product of conception. No, it doesn't say any of that. It says the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. The baby leapt in her womb. The Bible is saying there's a baby in there. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, we all know what's in there, right? There's not a squirrel in there, okay? There's not a, a rodent of some kind. It's not a blob of tissue. It's a developing human being, like all of us are. You say, well, you know, the baby is not viable. Look, I know some teenagers that aren't viable, right? <laughs> if you leave them alone, they're going to die. A newborn isn't viable. A newborn's going to die if the mother doesn't take care of it. That's not the point. The point is it's a human being in there. By the way, do you realize that if Mary lived in the United States, she could have killed Jesus without penalty in the womb. And Mary could have killed John the Baptist, or Elizabeth could have killed John the Baptist. Now, should Christians even get involved in a topic like this? Isn't that imposing our morality on people? Isn't that a violation of the separation of church and state? Aren't we not supposed to impose our values on people? And should Christians even get involved in politics? That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to try and do three things tonight and then go to your questions. First question we have to answer is, should Christians be involved in politics? Because a lot of people will say no. Just preach the gospel. Don't spend all your time or any of your time trying to polish the rails of a sinking ship. If you haven't noticed, our country is sinking. Why worry? Jesus is going to come back anyway. Why should you care? Just preach the gospel. That's what's really important anyway. That's what people say. Secondly, what are the most important issues? If we are to be involved in politics, what are the most important issues? And then finally, we're going to talk about what are the top 10 questions to ask about the sex issues. Top 10 questions to ask about what are the sex issues, LGBTQ, all that stuff. Because people want to talk about those issues because, unfortunately, many people in the church don't talk about them. We're silent about them, expecting them to go away. Yeah, they're not going away. So how do we talk about those issues? Now, I do have a pretty big warning for you guys here. This presentation is rated at least PG-13, okay? In fact, I hope to be correct, not politically correct. Is that okay? Let's be correct, not politically correct. And let me take a cue from Thomas Sowell, who is a economist who's about 91. He's turning 91. He may have just turned 91 years old. Here's what... Uh, Thomas Sowell said about telling people the truth, and he nails this point. He says, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. And I submit to you, a lot of us as Christians don't want to go into these topics because we're afraid we're going to get blowback from people who don't agree with us, and when we do that, you know what we're doing? We're helping ourselves. We're not really helping other people. We're just trying to prevent other people from being mad at us. And so we go, well, I'm not even going to talk about it then, or I'm just going to agree with you. If you want to love people, you tell them the truth. If you want to just love yourself and forget about them, then just tell them what they want to hear. So I hope to tell you the truth, even if you don't want to hear it. <laughs> so here we go. You ready? First question, should Christians be involved in politics? And when people tell me Christians ought not be involved in politics, I normally tell them to Google something, and in five seconds they see why Christians, and in fact all people, ought to be involved in politics. And here's the picture that comes up when I tell them to Google certain words. Does anyone know what this is? What is this? Anyone? This is the Korean Peninsula. At night, quite obviously, a satellite picture of Korea. Notice South Korea is filled with productivity. It's filled with light. North Korea, on the other hand, is a concentration camp. There's one major reason for the difference between South and North Korea. Don't say electricity. We know that, okay? <laughs> What's the major reason for the difference in productivity between South and North Korea? Politics. Politics is the reason that South Korea is free 
and has the gospel and has productivity and is able to feed its people and the north does not. My only question for you is which country would you rather live in, South Korea or North Korea? Everyone wants to live in South Korea. Why? Because of politics. And if you don't think politics are important, you actually don't think the gospel is important. Why? Because your ability to preach and live the gospel is partially dependent on the laws that are made in Washington, the laws that are made here in Columbia, and the laws that are made in your localities. Can you do what we're doing in this room right now in North Korea? Not legally. Why not? In fact, if you don't think politics are important, go to some of the countries I've been to. I've been to Iran. I've been to Saudi Arabia. I've been to China. You can't do any of what we're doing here right now in any of those countries. Not legally, because politically they've ruled it out. If for no other reason you ought to be involved in politics, is you ought to care enough about the gospel to ensure that people have the religious freedom to not only preach the gospel, but live it. Oh, you say, well, Frank, we have the First Amendment. Yeah, we've got the First Amendment, and some people are beginning to ignore it, aren't they? Freedom is never free. This is why when Benjamin Franklin helped write the United States Constitution, and he was asked right after they wrote the Constitution by a lady, what kind of government have you given us, Dr. Franklin? He responded this way, a republic, if you can keep it, Because unless freedom is defended, it's going to go away by totalitarian-minded people who want to take your freedoms away in the name of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity. In fact, if you think about this, politic politics affects almost everything you do. Politics affects your church, your family, your health, your money, your business, your freedom, your property, your school, your home, your safety, evangelism, the poor, the unborn. Just about everyone and everything are affected by politics. And one of the two great things they tell you never to talk about, never talk about religion or politics. Gee, they're about the only two things we're talking about. How are we going to live now and how are we going to live in eternity if there is one? It's a lie from the pit of hell that you ought not talk about these things. Now, obviously, if they make laws that are bad laws, you can be hurt in every one of these areas. And who's supposed to make the laws? In America, anyway, we are, the republic. Now, what is the purpose of government? You ever ask yourself that question? Why do we have governments at all? What's the purpose? Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 13, and the best or most complete theological statement of Christianity is the book of Romans itself. And when Paul gets to chapter 13, he's talking about what's the purpose of government? And here's what he says. Government is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. In other words, good governments protect their citizens from evil. The main purpose of government is to protect innocent people from evil. If you don't have government, you have anarchy, and if you have anarchy, then it's every person for him or herself, and that's a disaster. You have to have good governments. And why do we need good governments? Why do we need governments to restrain evil? James Madison said this in Federalist 51, one of the papers they wrote as they're writing the Constitution. James Madison is really the author of the United States Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights. Here's what Madison said, probably the most pithy thing ever said about government. He said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If we were inherently good, we wouldn't need people to restrain evil. But since we're not inherently good, it's easy to be bad, it's hard to be good, we need government. This is why, by the way, socialism doesn't work. Because it misunderstands human nature. Socialism thinks everybody's going to work as hard as they can and take as little as they need. Reality is people are going to work as little as they can and take as much as they want. If you don't incentivize people to work, you're not going to have a good functioning society. Is it any wonder why people can't get anybody to work for them right now? It's because we're paying people to stay home. So. Christianity understands human nature. Many other worldviews don't. 
They think people are inherently good. People are not inherently good. We're inherently evil. It's easy to be bad. It's hard to be good. In fact, it's at our core. And I can give you just one illustration to point this out. Let's suppose before you came over here tonight, you went into the bathroom to get ready. You looked in the mirror, and you saw a sign on your head. And the sign transmitted every single thought you had in big LED letters. And you couldn't shut off the sign. You couldn't cover the sign. Everybody could read exactly what you were thinking or what you were, what, what you were thinking at that very moment. Question, would you be here right now? No, you wouldn't have left your bathroom. You wouldn't even let anybody in your family see your head. Because your thoughts and my thoughts are evil. And we have to restrain ourselves from doing evil. This is why, by the way, no extra charge for this. This is why you can't remember names when you meet somebody. Because you meet somebody, you go, hey, John, you're not thinking about the name. You're thinking about how stupid his shirt it looks. <laughs> right? You're thinking about other things. Bill, Ed, whatever your name is over there. Um, no. Because your thoughts are evil. And this is a good piece of evidence that Christianity has the right worldview when it comes to the nature of human beings. This is why we need government, and we need good government. Now, we, unfortunately, we don't teach history anymore. Most of, our, most of us think history is the first page of a Google search, and we don't think anything really happened before we were born. But let's go back all the way 2,000 years. What have Christians accomplished politically across the world? Here are some of the things Christians abolished politically, slavery, gladiatorial combat, death games, temple prostitution, kidnapped brides, wives as property, infanticide, child labor, child marriage, child sex abuse, child prostitution, and class distinctions. By the way, what's the only worldview that's going to protect individual human rights? Well, the Muslims aren't going to do it. Muslims believe if you're not a Muslim, then you're a second-rate citizen. Uh, the Hindus aren't going to do it. Why? They have a caste system. Same thing. And you're somewhere in that caste, and you were born into that. There's nothing you can do about it. Atheistic worldview isn't going to do it. Why? Because there is no objective morality on atheism. He who has the most power gets to set the rules. That's what they call the golden rule. He who has the gold rules. Only Christianity is going to recognize that everybody has individual rights because they're made in the image of God. This is why even some atheists over in the UK, pretty vehement atheists like Richard Dawkins, you may have heard the name, he wrote the book The God Delusion, and he has mocked Christianity for years. He's starting to alter his tone a little bit. Why? Because he realizes he'd rather have Christians in charge than Muslims. Because Sharia law will shut down all sorts of freedoms. And he realizes that an atheistic, secularistic viewpoint is not going to stand up against Islam. Only a robust Christianity will. So watch what you ask for. If you try and get rid of religion, you're going to get rid of Christianity. If you get rid of Christianity, there goes human rights. Also, you might say, well, where do biblical characters, uh, they don't get involved in politics. Au contraire. Look at all of these people in the Bible that got involved politically, not only with the, the governments of Israel, but some of these people went after other governments, like the prophets. All of these people, Joseph, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Nehemiah, Esther, Nahum, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, John the Baptist, Paul, and Jesus, all got involved in influencing governments. Now, this might obviously might not be the top calling for all of us, but if we don't have political and religious freedom, there goes our ability to preach and live the gospel. And if we're not going to protect life, who is? Now, with that said, there are a couple of objections we need to deal with. The top object objection is probably this, the separation of church and state. Okay, let me point out that this objection actually really has no teeth to it. Why? Well... First of all, this has nothing to do with legislating certain moral viewpoints. We're not trying to legislate religion. No one, or at least very few people in America, are trying to say 
that you have to be a member of a particular church, that you have to uh, have a certain view on the second coming, that you have to have a certain theological viewpoint on whether you're saved by faith or works. That's not what we're talking about. We're not trying to legislate religion. We're not trying to tell you you have to be a part of a particular church or get involved in certain rites or rituals or worship celebrations. But we are telling people how they ought to treat one another, and that's legislating morality. And how many times have you heard you can't legislate morality? You know what the, the exact truth is? You can't not legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law which doesn't say, this is right and this is wrong. That's what, this is wrong. That's what laws do. So we're not trying to legislate church. We're not trying to legislate religion. We're trying to legislate morality, and that's what everyone's trying to do. The only question is, whose morality should we legislate? That's the question. Not whether or not we can legislate it. Every law legislates some kind of morality. The only question is who. So when people bring up the separation of church and state, the first thing you want to ask them is, what do you mean by that? What does that even mean, separation of church and state? Do you think anybody in the political square right now is trying to get people to be a member of a certain church? Are they trying to make it illegal to not be a Christian? No, nobody's trying to do that. This language, by the way, isn't even in the Constitution. Where does it come from? It comes from a letter that, jo that uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist in Danbury, Connecticut, because the Baptists up there were worried that perhaps Jefferson or the federal government was going to get involved in the church too much. And Jefferson wrote back, no, there's a wall of separation between church and state, meaning he didn't want the government involved in the church. He was open and wanted the church to be involved in the government. It was a one-way separation. But he didn't want the church to get involved or the state to get involved in the church. That's why he called it the separation of church and state. But the First Amendment doesn't say what people today think it says. What does the First Amendment say? Can anyone just say it off the top of their head? See, this is the problem. Most of us can't. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then it talks about assembly, petition, other rights, rights of free speech. It says, Congress shall not make a law establishing a religion or prohibiting a religion. It's not talking about setting up a state church, although I know this is going to sound crazy, but this is, this is the truth. When the United States Constitution was ratified in 1791, five of the 13 states had their own state churches. They could read the amendment. The, 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 the amendment said, Congress shall make no law. The individual, the individual state houses, they, they, could, they could have a national, or I should say, a state religion, and they did. It wasn't until Massachusetts in 1833 did the final state church go away. They didn't want a federal church. They could have a state church. So mo most of what you hear about this is slogans. Nobody really talks about the truth of it anymore. We're not trying to legislate religion. We are trying to legislate morality, and everyone's trying to legislate morality. The only question is whose morality. Okay, the next objection is closely related to this, and it's this one. Don't impose your morality on me. Now, when people say that, I normally say back, why not? Would that be immoral? Because you see, what are they doing? They're imposing a morality on me when they say that, or on you if they say it to you. They're saying you ought not impose ought nots, which is exactly what they're doing to you. They're saying you can't impose your ought nots, but I can impose mine. Notice that? But actually, the better answer is this. When people say, don't impose your morality on me, I say this. This isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong, that theft is wrong, that rape is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize the man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. Everybody already knows basic right and wrong. It's written on your heart. 
It's based on the design of nature, that the way God designed things. We already know about this, but we suppress it, as Paul says in Romans 1. We want to go our own way. We don't want there to be a God. One thing I forgot to mention. When people say, you can't legislate it because it's in the Bible. Now think about this for a second, ladies and gentlemen. If we couldn't have laws that are in the Bible, what laws could we have? You know the Bible says thou shall not murder? Oh, guess that means we can't legislate it. The Bible says thou shall not steal. Oh, sorry, can't have laws against theft. Isn't that ridiculous? If we can't legislate what's in the Bible, we couldn't virtually have any laws because they're all in some way a derivative of one of the Ten Commandments. But because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that we're legislating religion. Again, Christianity talks about Moral issues for good reason. But that doesn't mean we're legislating a religion or asking people to be a part of a religion when we say thou shall not murder and thou shall not steal and thou shall not abort your children. Those are moral issues consistent with the Bible. Now the natural law that we all understand intuitively, the one that Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident that all men were created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That natural law comes from the same source as the Bible, God. But Jefferson and some other framers of the Constitution wanted to ensure that people had rights from God without imposing a a religion on people. So what they said was, these rights come from God, but you don't have to believe in God. You don't have to be a member of a particular church. Our country was founded on God, but it allows atheists and everybody else to be here. So our country's founded on what we call theism, that there's a God out there, the Judeo-Christian God. Now, if you don't like it, fine, you can go somewhere else. But that's what our country's founded on. Again, you can be an atheist and be here. You can be anything you want and be here, but that's how our country was founded. So it's not my morality I'm imposing. It's the morality. Now, if you don't like the morality, that's fine, but you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. So, should Christians be involved in politics? Yes. In fact, I think everybody ought to be involved in politics. And when people say Christians ought not be involved in politics, what are you going to ask them? You should ask them first, what do you mean by that and why not? Are only atheists qualified to run the country? Where does that come from? Second question is, what are the most important issues when we're involved in politics? Well, let me ask you this. How many many times have you heard people say, all sins are the same? You heard people say that? Is that true? No, it's not true. It is true that all sin separates us from God, but that doesn't mean that all sins are the same. In fact, Jesus talks about a lot of different ways to say that all sins are not the same, just like all meritorious acts are not the same. You help somebody across the street, it's not quite as good as jumping on a grenade for somebody, right? And here, I don't have time to go through all the scriptures that talk about this, right now, but Jesus talks about the greatest commandment, greater love, greater sin, greater judgment, greater knowledge equals greater punishment, and he also talks about the more important matters of the law. So not all sins are the same. In fact, what he's saying here is there's a moral hierarchy, that some things are more important than others. In fact, you might know the moral hierarchy from a moral dilemma. Suppose you're in Nazi Germany during World War II. You're hiding Jews in your attic. And you get a knock at the door. Schnell! Schnell! You open the door. A couple of German Nazi soldiers there. Hast du hier, Juden? You have Jews here? What are you going to say? You're going to lie? It says thou shalt not bear false witness. You're going to lie? Is that what you're going to do? No. Of course you're going to say, sure, yeah, we got Jews up there. And if they're up in the attic. If you go upstairs and you only see three of them, keep looking. There's actually four of them. Okay? Just keep looking. 
No, what are you going to say? Nine. Why? Because you have a greater duty to protect innocent life than you do to tell the truth to a guilty murderer. In other words, there's a hierarchy. And if you're caught in a moral dilemma, your duty is to obey the higher moral absolute and you're exempted from the lower moral absolute. And this is what my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, in his book, Christian Ethics, calls graded absolutism. Yes, there are absolutes, but when they conflict, you have a greater duty to protect innocent life than you do to tell the truth to a guilty murderer. This is a moral hierarchy. And so you just know this intuitively. We know this in our court system, right? In our judicial system. If somebody murders somebody, they're going to go away for a longer period of time than somebody just jaywalking. Unless you're a Christian jaywalking in California, then you might get the same amount of time <laughs> as a murderer, right? Because there's a hierarchy. Now, this last thing, more important matters of the law. A lot of people say Jesus never got involved in politics. That's not true. In fact, the more important matters of the law is what he talks about when he's talking to the politicians. Who are the politicians of his day? The Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? They were a group of religious political leaders, and some of them were on the Sanhedrin. What was the Sanhedrin? That was the Jewish ruling council, kind of like the Jewish Supreme Court, to whom Rome delegated a lot of the day-to-day -day legal authority to run Israel. So they were the politicians of Jesus' day. And Jesus went after these people repeatedly. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, here's what he says to them at one point. This is uh, Matthew chapter 23. Here's what he says. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, you blind guides. You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus went after people. He was tough. And notice, he's saying, look, you guys, you have tithed your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you're neglecting the more important matters of the law. Do you know we're doing the same thing? If Jesus were here today, he would say, well, he is here today, but not physically, right? But if he were here today, what would he say to our politicians? Wait a minute, wait, wait, time out. You're telling us what light bulbs we can and can't use, but you're not telling us don't kill our children? Are we neglecting the more important matters of the law? Are we neglecting the moral hierarchy? We're turning into the nanny state. And yet we're ignoring the biggest issues. What could be bigger than life? The right to life is the right to all other rights. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. And yet we're neglecting it. So Frank, you're, you're probably asking, well, does abortion trump everything else? Well, let me ask you, what do you think Jesus would think about abortion? We already know what he thinks about it. Thou shalt not murder. He's part of the Godhead that wrote the, New, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the entire Bible. Thou shalt not murder. Now, I know there's probably people in here who have either had an abortion or contributed to an abortion. I'm not here to condemn you, and neither is Jesus. What we're here to do is prevent it from happening again because all of your sins can be forgiven by trusting in Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. Christ takes your punishment on himself. But let's not buy into the idea that this is just the ending of a pregnancy or the product of conception. Notice how Satan always comes as an angel of light. He makes it sound like it's not that big a deal. No, it is a big deal. Now you're probably asking, well, Frank, are you a one-issue voter? Are you a one-issue voter? No, I'm not a one-issue voter. Voter, I'm a one-issue disqualifier. What does that mean? It means 
that being pro-life doesn't necessarily qualify you as a candidate, but being pro-abortion necessarily disqualifies you as a candidate. I don't want my, my elected officials just to be pro-life and they're not good on anything else. I want them to be pro-life and good on other things too. So I'm looking for more than just a pro-life candidate, but I want a pro-life candidate. If that person is not pro-life, I'm not going to support that person. How can I? Does that make sense? I want, I want the, the candidates to be good on marriage. I want candidates to be good on the economy. I want candidates to be good on the military and good on police and good on, on uh, so many other issues. But if you're not good on life, you've disqualified yourself in my view because you're neglecting the more important matters of the law. Your main role as a person in government is to protect innocent people from evil. You're not only not doing that, you're now encouraging the government to pay for evil. Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's where we are. By the way, you know whose fault all this is? That our country is where it is now? We can all go home and look in the mirror because it's our fault. Because the country is where it is now because the church hasn't been the church for the past hundred years. In about 1920, the church went anti-intellectual. What does that mean? They didn't think they could answer things like Darwinism. So instead of engaging the culture, they separated from the culture. And they created their own little Bible schools and Bible colleges and seminaries and all these things. And they said, don't get involved in politics. Don't get involved in law. Don't get involved in media. Don't get involved in any of these things. They're all dirty. And we bought into the idea that there's only two professions out there that are sacred. You can be in the ministry as a pastor or you can be a missionary. Everything else is secular. That's not the Christian worldview. Every profession that's moral is sacred. Everyone is, no matter what they, thanks, Joe, Joe. Go, man, yeah, that's right. I got somebody in here who thought something was said properly. But when we took all the godly people out of law, out of the media, out of journalism, out of all these things, is it any wonder why those endeavors went godless? If you take the godly people out, you get godlessness. And that's why our country is where it is today. In fact, I wrote a column a number of years ago. It's on our website, crossexamine.org. And the title of it is, Country a Mess, Blame the Church. We're the problem. I'm not blaming the people on the other side of the aisle who are just doing what they think is right. Our problem is we're not doing what we know is right. And by the way, if you want to fix this country politically, you don't have to convince one person outside the church. You just have to convince the church to actually be salt and light. Problems solved. So now, what are the top 10 questions to ask about the sex issues? And it, before we get to the top 10 questions, we're going to have to set this up by asking a number of questions. And the first questions we're going to ask, are these really rights? Number one, you hear, I have a right to choose an abortion. Actually, they don't really say, I have a right to choose an abortion. They just say, I have a right to choose. Why? Because that sounds so good. Who's, who could be against a right to choose, right? But as soon as you ask them to complete the sentence, you have the right to choose a murder? You have a right to choose the death of an innocent human being? No, none of us have that right. They say, I have a right to taxpayer funding of abortion. I have the right to marry whom I love. That sounds so good, doesn't it? Isn't that what marriage is all about? Just love and good feelings. And... I have the right to force you to participate in my same-sex marriage ceremony. If you're a photographer, a caterer, uh, a florist, a baker, I have the right to constrict you to use your artistic talents to celebrate my same-sex wedding. That's what many people are saying now. I have the right to change my sex. And I have the right to live my truth. Do you have the right to live your truth? What does that even mean? 
we're going to look into it. Let me, let me ask you a question in order to answer these questions. Um, how do you know your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing an interception? How do you know that? Go ahead. Say again. Yes, well, the rules, not just the, it's part, partly based on the rules. It's the what? What are you trying to do in a game of football? Win. How do you win? Get more points. Okay, the purpose of the game is to get more points than the other team. And you know that a touchdown gets you that. Your guy throwing an interception doesn't. Right? So you say, okay, a touchdown's a good play, interception, bad play. Right? Now, notice that the purpose of the game and the rules of the game come from outside the game. In other words, the players aren't making up the rules while they're on the field, right? Those rules are imposed on them by the commissioner and the owners. They come together and say, hey, what are going to be the rules of this game? All right, we got the rules? Great. Okay, now you know what a good play is and what a bad play is based on the rules. If there were no rules to the game, could you say that a touchdown was better than an interception? If there was no purpose to the game? No, you couldn't say that. It would just be, well, that, that, we don't know what that is. We don't know what, what happened there. Well, the same thing is true in life, ladies and gentlemen. The rules of life come from outside life. They come from a standard beyond us. If there's no standard beyond us, you can't say that loving people is better than murdering them. Because that would just be your opinion against, say, Hitler's opinion. If there's nobody to adjudicate between you and Hitler, how do you know that loving people is better than killing them? If there's no purpose to life, how can you say this is a good way to live and this is a bad way to live? A good way to live is getting closer to the purpose. A bad way to live is getting further away. You can't. You've got to have a standard outside life to say this is the right way to live. And this is the wrong way to live. Now, the rules of football, of course, are arbitrary. They're made up. But the rules of life aren't arbitrary. They come from God's nature. God is the standard of goodness. And aligning ourselves with his will is what we ought to do if we're going to live a life of goodness. Now, here's a word nobody likes to hear. The word submission. What does that word mean? What does the word submission mean? It means to put yourself and your will under the authority of somebody else or some other job, someone's plan. Now, a good football team puts their individual will under the will of the coach, the game plan, right? If I'm a diva receiver and I say, man, keep throwing me the ball, how come I'm not getting the ball enough? And yet it would be better for the team if other people got the ball sometimes? I'm not submitting my will to the will of the team. I'm not subverting my mission to the, to the mission of the team. And what we're supposed to do as Christians is we're supposed to submit our will to, the, to God's mission. Do you see that? That's what submission means. But we don't want to do that. Why? Because we think we know better. We want to do our own thing. Now hold on to that thought about submission for a second. If somebody ever says any of these things are rights, what you want to ask them is by what standard are these really rights? By what standard are these really rights? Because if there is no God, there are no rights. It would just be your opinion against somebody else's opinion. Yet everyone knows we have rights. We have the right to free speech. We have the right to religion. We have the right to life, obviously. Where do rights come from? They don't come from government. If they came from government, they wouldn't be rights. They'd be preferences. The Declaration of Independence puts it rightly that governments are instituted among men to secure rights. In other words, God has given you your rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created equal and endowed by their government. No, endowed by their creator were certain inalienable rights. 
Rights come from government. They don't. They come from God. And if they come from God, then rights are just secured by governments. Now, are any of these rights, does, is God for abortion? Is he for tax payer? Is he for any of these things? No. Yet here's what people are doing. They're stealing rights from God while claiming he doesn't exist. Or they're claiming God agrees with them on these. Well, you, you need some evidence for that. Where's God saying these are good things? Now, in order to really analyze what's going on here, we've got to talk about truth. And whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, No, no, he didn't say it that way. You can't handle the truth. If he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. Here's how he said it. All right, let's try it again. I want the truth. Now, that felt better, didn't it? That felt a lot better. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. And let me point out, we mentioned this this morning, if someone ever says there is no truth, you should ask that person a question, what should the question be? Is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Now you see what we're doing here? We're turning the claim on itself. Turning the claim on itself because this statement claims to be, claims there is no truth at the same time claiming there is no truth. It's self-defeating. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. Hold on to this thought because we're about to apply it to people living their own truth, my truth. In fact, I hear atheists, when I, I talk about this, a lot of atheists will say, well, nobody ever says there's no truth. Actually, some people do. But they don't always say it the same way. Like, this is an example of someone saying there's no truth. It's just said a different way. All truth is relative. Now, if you turn the claim on itself, what are you going to say to this person? Yes, is that a relative truth? See, because this is an absolute truth claim, claiming that all truth is relative. It's not relative. It's absolutely true. They're trying to say it's absolutely true. All truth is relative. Do you see the problem with that? It's self-defeating. So now that we know this concept of turning a claim on itself, let's apply it to this claim that we brought up a minute ago. I have the right to live my truth. Notice, by the way, that this is a moral claim. It's a moral claim. I have the right to live my truth. When someone has a moral claim, you want to ask them, by what standard is that true? By what standard are you saying you have the right to live your own truth? Where does that come from? But if you turn the claim on itself, what could you say to somebody who says that? You could say, is that the truth or just your truth? Is that the truth or just your truth? If it's the truth, then... It's self-defeating. Why? Because they just said it was just my truth. I know this is, this can give you brain freeze here, right? If they say it's just your truth or my truth, then it's just a subjective claim. I'm not obligated to obey it then, right? If it's just your truth and not my truth or the truth, I'm not obligated to obey it. It's a self-defeating claim, in other words. In fact, there are several responses you can say to somebody who says, I have the right to live my truth. One response you can say is this. Do I have the right to live my truth? What do you think the other person is going to have to say? Well, of course you do. When they say that, then you can say this. Then why do you insist I live your truth? Do you see what's going on here? How, how are they insisting... That we live their truth. Well, if somebody says you have to use my pronouns or whatever, or you have to participate in my same-sex wedding, or whatever is, is the, uh, or if you don't agree with me, I'm going to cancel you, right? 
wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought everyone got to live their own truth, and yet here I am trying to live my truth, and you're claiming me I can't live my truth. I have to live your truth. I have to participate in your truth. I can't live my own truth. How come you get to set all the rules? Or you could say this. What if my truth contradicts your truth? What if it contradicts your truth? What if your truth is, is that everybody's got to use certain pronouns, and my truth is everybody doesn't? What then? What are they going to say? Oh, you have to live my truth. Wait, wait. <laughs> you, unless God is behind all this, no, I don't. This is not a right you have to impose your truth on everybody else. Or you could say, what if my truth is to live the truth? And that means disagreeing with you on certain points. Do you see how problematic this is? By the way, can you have a community without unity? No, you can't live in a community unless you have shared moral values. And if people are going to claim that whatever they think in their head, everybody else has to obey, and other people don't agree with that, you're going to have conflict, and that's where we are right now. Do you know what the new religion in America is? I used to say it's the religion of sex, but it's actually broader than the religion, religion of sex. The new religion in America is more meology than it is theology. And unfortunately, this is filtered into the church. It's all about me. Whatever I want is what's most important. Not what God wants. There's no call to suffering for Christ. It's all what I want. It's meology. And if things aren't going just my way, there's something wrong with God. I know Calvary Chapel is not a prosperity gospel church, but there are churches that are. You know the prosperity gospel that says if you're not healthy and wealthy, it's just because you don't have enough faith? That can easily be refuted by one simple observation. Look at Jesus and the apostles. Were they healthy and wealthy? No, they got beaten, tortured, and murdered for saying Christianity was true. Don't tell me they didn't have enough faith. Jesus said if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. Paul said everyone who lives a faithful life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Get ready, it's coming if it hasn't come already. The question is, are you going to deny Christ like Peter did, or are you going to stand firm when persecution comes? You say, Frank, but we're supposed to love people. Well, let me ask you this question. Does love require approval? Because our culture says, yes, love requires approval. If you want to love me, you must have approve of everything I want to do. Is that truly love? Parents, if you approve of everything your kid wants to do, are you loving? No, you're unloving. If you don't stand in the way of evil, you're unloving. You have to stand in the way of evil to love people. Even evil they want to do and will hate you for opposing. If you don't stand in the way of evil, you're not loving. Now, there's a famous passage that everyone reads at their wedding, but nobody obeys. It's 1 Corinthians 13. You know the love passage? Love is patient, love is kind, all that. I submit to you, if you read that whole thing, you're not going to find a feeling in there. Love is not a feeling. Love is a decision to seek what's best for the other person. If love was a feeling... How could you love your enemies? You don't feel good about your enemies. If love was a feeling, how could you take a vow at a marriage altar? Can you vow to feel a certain way for the rest of your life? Of course you can't. You can't stand up here and vow to feel a certain way the rest of your life. You might as well say, I promise to never feel hungry again. Or I never, I'll, never fear, I'll never feel angry again. Or I'll never feel tired again. You can't vow feelings. All you can vow is actions. And by the way, you wouldn't need a vow if you always felt good about your spouse. You don't need vows when you're feeling all warm and fuzzy about your loved one. 
You only need a vow when you're not feeling that way. That's why you need a vow. As Rodney Dangerfield famously said, my wife and I were happy for 20 years. And then we met. <laughs> right? Marriage is hard. Why? Because you put two broken people in one relationship, there's going to be trouble. That's why you need a vow. You don't need a vow if everything's peachy keen all the time. So love is not a feeling. And sometimes to love people, you have to oppose what they do. This is why in 1 Corinthians 13, here's what Paul says. Love always protects. Love rejoices in the truth. Love always perseveres. And the reason, one reason we ought to be involved in politics is because the way you love people politically is through good laws. We are not helping... We are not helping people by even giving them the option to murder their children. We're not loving them, and we're certainly not loving the children. We're not loving families by saying that same-sex marriage is just like opposite-sex marriage. Do you know what the biggest, one of the biggest problems with same-sex marriage is? Is that it makes marriage genderless. It makes it genderless. It says that gender has nothing to do with marriage. Well, if gender has nothing to do with marriage, then neither do children. If there is one institution devoted to children, it's marriage. And yet, now we've made marriage all about feelings. Do you know why we have same-sex marriage? It's not the LGBT community. You know why we have it? Because of Christians. Why? Because we bought into the idea that marriage was all about feelings. And once the feelings went away, you had the right to get another spouse. And so we brought in no-fault divorce. And I submit to you, no-fault divorce is a much bigger problem than same-sex marriage. Because I can tell you that at least half the people sitting in this room right now have been scarred by divorce scarred. My dad just died last year. He was 84. If two years ago he divorced my mom, I would be scarred and I'm 59 years old. As C.S. Lewis put it, divorce is like cutting up a living body. Not that there aren't justifications for it, there are, but most of the time there are no justifications for it. Not biblically. But if marriage is all about warm and fuzzy feelings and I don't have them for my spouse anymore and therefore I can dissolve the relationship, well then why can't two same-sex people get married if marriage is all about feelings? That's where the logic went. That's where we are. Marriage is in shambles because we haven't protected it. It's mostly our fault. Back to what Thomas Sowell said, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Have you been telling people in your life what they want to hear or what they need to hear? If we keep telling people what they want to hear, our country, our lives are going to continually go in the wrong direction. Has anyone here read the book called Live Not By Lies. Has anyone heard of that book? Written by Rod Dreher. Rod Dreher interviewed Soviet dissidents. People that lived behind the Iron Curtain. They're much older now. He said, but they've come to America and these Soviet dissidents are alarmed at what's going on in America now. They're alarmed because a soft totalitarianism has come across America where it's basically saying, if you don't agree with the politically correct viewpoint, you're going to get hurt. And what Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a Russian dissident, was he was kicked out of Russia in 1974 because he was a dissident. The last thing he said to the Russian people was, live not by lies. 
Meaning, if somebody is going to say, I'm a man, but you need to call me a woman, live not by lies. Because you're not doing that person any good if you acquiesce to what they want. Do you realize that the suicide rate for transgender people after the surgery is 19 times higher than the general public? Do you realize that? How are you helping somebody by affirming them in their psychological mismatch? You're not helping them. You are encouraging them to go down a road with such dire consequences. Dr. Paul McHugh from John Hopkins University likened transgenderism, gender dysphoria, to anorexia, where you have a psychological mismatch between your mind and your body. If someone had anorexia and you said, yeah, you're, you're right, you know, you are really dangerously overweight, we need to give you liposuction, would that be a good treatment? No. You'd, you'd say the opposite. No, sorry, your mind is wrong, your body's right. Look at your body, it's dangerously thin. You need to get nutrition, not liposuction. Same thing is true in transgenderism. There's a psychological mismatch between the mind and the body. You can't change your body. You can change your mind. You can't change your sex. Sorry, it's fixed. You can change your mind. Now, people really struggle with this. This is a true condition. But we're not helping people by encouraging them to get the wrong treatment. You don't fix a psychological issue with surgery. You fix a psychological issue with psychiatry. And we're buying into the idea that, no, you can't do that. So what are the top ten questions? Here they are. These are questions you should ask people when you're dealing with these sensitive issues. The first question is a question from the book Tactics by my friend Greg Kokel. If you haven't gotten that book Tactics, you need to read it. When you're ever asked a question that's controversial and you think the other person might disagree with you. The first question you want to ask is, do you consider yourself a tolerant person? Why do you want to say that? Because the other person is probably going to have to say yes, and then you can say great. Because if I offer an opinion that disagrees with yours, you'll tolerate it then, right? Because that's what tolerance is, right? By definition, in order to tolerate something, you have to disagree with it. You don't tolerate things you agree with. You agree with them. You only tolerate things you don't agree with. So always ask the question, do you consider yourself a tolerant person? They're going to have to say yes. And once they say that, then you're home free. If they get all mad after that, then you can say, hey, what about tolerance? What happened? Second question, where do rights come from? If they come from government, if they say government, then you're, oh, so you're saying the Jews had no rights under the Nazis. Is that what you're saying? Because the Nazis decided they didn't. Is that what you're saying? No, I don't think you're saying that. Rights don't come from government. In fact, the only way we could judge the Nazis is because we knew there was a standard beyond our government and their government called natural law, also called international law. And at the Nuremberg trials, when the Nazi soldiers said, oh, we were just following the orders of our government, we said you had a moral obligation to disobey immoral orders from your government and obey the nature of God, natural law. And you didn't do that, so you're guilty. Is there any sexual behavior that's wrong? Why is it wrong? I ask that question. By what standard is it wrong? Do you know where we're heading now? We're heading right toward pedophilia. That's about to, not, that's about to be accepted. Sex with children. It's coming. Where does your moral standard of right and wrong come from? If it's just your opinion, why are you trying to impose it on everybody else? Here's an interesting question you wouldn't think you'd have to ask anymore, but are men and women different? Are men and women different? No matter how the activist on the other side of this issue answers, they're going to be in trouble. If they say, yes, men and women are different, okay, then we should treat men and women in relationships differently in the sense that a man and a woman come together, they're not the same thing, 
they uh, procreate together. They can't procreate alone. Uh, man, it's, it's a crazy. We even have to talk about this. Do you, this is the PG-13 portion. Have you heard recently of people saying that women can have penises? Have you heard this? Men can breastfeed. Have you heard this? This is not a Rodney Dangerfield joke who said, no respect at all. When I was a kid, I was breastfed by my father. No, the people are saying this now. And Christians are going to buy into this? Oh, yeah, women can have penises and men can breastfeed. No, live not by lies. If you want to love people, even though they may hate you for it, you need to tell the truth. If they say men and women are not different, then you want to say to them, if they're not different, why do you care about same-sex marriage? The very reason you're for same-sex marriage is, is because you know men and women are different. If they're not different, then just marry somebody of the opposite sex. You said they're not different from the same sex. And how many genders are there out there, ladies and gentlemen? Two. And do you know what? Transgenderism presupposes that. How does it presuppose it? Because if I'm a man, but I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, I have to some, have some idea of what a man is in order to know that and some idea of what a woman is in order to make the transition to that. Transgenderism presupposes fixed genders. Otherwise, there would be no such thing as transgenderism. Yet, they're trying to say there are, I don't know how many genders now, and they're trying to say that there's a difference between biological sex and gender. The problem is when they say that is they don't really mean it because they want everybody to believe that whatever a person thinks in their mind, that's what their sex is. That's why they can say women can have penises. They want you to ignore biology. Now, who are the science deniers here? It's not the Christians. This is such a fun topic, isn't it? This is why, by the way, sometimes when people say, oh, there's no evidence for God, I like to ask them, is there any evidence for gender? If they say no, I say, I can't help you with the God question, right? If you can't look in the mirror and know what you are, I can't help you about believing in an invisible being that created and sustains all things. I mean, you're just suppressing the truth about this. And tragically, many of our young girls are getting caught up into this. There's been over a 4,000% increase in young girls claiming to be trans now in, the re in recent years. Gee, what do you think that's come from? It's come from social media. Because now, if somebody comes out as trans, what suddenly do they get? They get all sorts of attention. Oh, this is great, this is wonderful, and nobody can say anything negative. You want to love that person? You better tell them the truth. For what government purpose, or for what purpose is the government involved in marriage? People think marriage is because people love one another. No, that's not the reason the government's involved. When you go for a marriage license, they say, do you really love him? Do you really love her? No, they're not asking that. What's, what's the purpose of marriage? The purpose of marriage from a government perspective is to perpetuate and stabilize society because the only relationship that can perpetuate and stabilize society is the man-woman biological relationship which procreates and nurtures children. Without that, civilization is over. This is why radical groups like Black Lives Matter, believe it or not, and I, we all know black lives do matter, but the group itself is not just about race. The group wants to get rid of the biological family. You can read it. It was on their website. They scrubbed it. It's a Marxist organization that wants to get rid of biological realities. So governments involved in marriage to perpetuate and stabilize society. And when you say two men or two women are the same as a man and a woman, what you're basically saying is that that's not the purpose of government anymore, or the purpose of marriage anymore to the government. It's not to perpetuate and stabilize society. It's to recognize romantic affinity. Well, who cares about romantic affinity from a government perspective? The government doesn't care if Ed loves Mary or Bill loves Steve. Why should the government care about that? It shouldn't. 
What the government should care about is bringing up the next generation in biological two-parent family homes so they will turn out to be good citizens and perpetuate and stabilize society. Here are a couple of questions you can ask to illustrate the importance of marriage to civilization. First question, what would happen to society if everyone lived faithfully in natural marriage? Marriage between a man and a woman. It's not traditional marriage. It's not based on tradition. It's based on natural teleology, biology. What would happen if everyone lived faithfully in natural marriage? What would happen to abortion? Reduced. What would happen to child abuse? Reduced. Obviously, divorce would go away. What would happen to children getting into crime? Massively reduced. Do you know the number one social problem other than abortion where we're killing people, the number one social problem in America is fatherlessness. You look at kids that come out of fatherless homes, they account for more than 80% of the crimes in America. Disproportionate number of suicides. It's tragic. So every, everything would get a lot better. By the way, your taxes would go down too. Why? Because the government wouldn't have to bloat itself to be the social welfare system that it is now if people took care of one another in their own families. Which means spending would go down, which means taxes would go down, which means mom wouldn't, or dad, whoever decided not to work, wouldn't have to work because you wouldn't have to make so much money to live where you live and pay all the taxes you have to pay. You wouldn't have to have dual incomes anymore. Next question, what would happen to society if everyone lived faithfully in same-sex marriage? It would be the end of civilization. Now, I'm not saying any law which allowed same-sex marriage would do this. I'm simply pointing out that these two questions help us understand the importance of marriage between a man and a woman. Without it, civilization goes away. Does love require approval? That's a question you can ask. Do you ever disagree with those you love? Yeah, in fact, to love people, you have to disagree with them sometimes. And then finally, if the person's a Christian, so you disagree with Jesus on this? What did Jesus say marriage was? Between a man and a woman, Matthew 19. So you're going to disagree with Jesus. And that's the, one of the biggest problems today in, in the church, ladies and gentlemen, is that people are disagreeing with Jesus, and they're claiming to be Christians. Look, if you're a Christian, and you're disagreeing with Jesus, don't call yourself a Christian. If you're a Muslim, you're supposed to agree with Allah. If you're a Buddhist, you're supposed to agree with Buddha. If you're a Jew, you're supposed to agree with Yahweh. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to agree with Jesus. So, top ten questions. So, should Christians be involved in politics? Yeah, everybody should. And Christians ought to be involved, if for no other reason, to protect your religious liberty to preach and live the gospel. What are the most important issues? The most important issue is life. The right to life is the right to all other rights. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. And we should ensure that we're not neglecting the more important matters of the law. And we just went through the top ten questions. So, if we're not going to be concerned about this, ladies and gentlemen, who is? Who's going to rescue the little ones from death, if not Christians? Now, if you want to get more on this, we ran out of the Stealing from God book, but the correct, not politically correct book is still over there. That's called How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. That's the subtitle. I wrote that book in 2008, updated it in 2016. I actually got fired for writing that book. Before I was doing this full-time, I was doing training for companies like Cisco and Bank of America and someone in Cisco figured out they had written that book. I was fired that very day, even though that book was never a topic of anything I did. I was fired in the name of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity. And when I met with the HR director over that, I kept asking her questions like, what does inclusion mean? What does diversity mean? What does tolerance mean? And she couldn't answer the questions with anything more than platitudes, so we went public with it, which basically torpedoed any chance I'd ever work in corporate America again. And I wrote a column on it called Sex at Work. Do not Google that. Okay? Do not Google Sex at Work. Okay? Go to our website, crossexamine.org, and in the search engine, type Sex at Work on the website, and you'll find the article. And my basic question is, why, are, why is corporate America talking about Sex at Work? Uh, 
Are, are we supposed to have sex at work? What's the point of this? What does this have to do with workplace productivity? I mean, it's not like we're all working in the Clinton White House here. Right? What does this have to do with, with productivity? It doesn't. So why is corporate America obsessed with sex? That's my question. And unless Christians start standing up and saying, sorry, I treat everyone with respect regardless of whether I agree with them politically or not, but why are you trying to get me to violate my conscience? Why are you trying to do that? I don't want you to violate your conscience, but I expect the same respect in return. Don't ask me to violate my conscience to make widgets. Do we have to have all the same political views here in order to work? In this company? Is that what you're saying? We all have to have the same political views? We have to have the same religious views? We have to have the same moral views? Is that what you're telling me? Really? If they say yes, then you have a civil rights lawsuit. And by the way, if this ever happens to you, there's one person you should call, and that's the Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF. ADF are Christian attorneys that will take your case pro bono if it's a good case. They're out of Phoenix, Arizona. Just Google them, Alliance Defending Freedom. They've been to Supreme Court several times. Now, I can send you some, uh, some PowerPoints on this. Type the word pro-life, no space, to 44222. Pro-life to 44222. And uh, we'll send you some PowerPoints on what we talked about today, similar PowerPoints to what we've done. And uh, there'll be a lot of free stuff up there that can help you in this regard, all right? Now, the rest of the time, we want to spend on questions. That's what this microphone is up here for. So since no one likes to ask the first question, let's move right on to the second question, okay? <laughs> second question, microphone. Just come on up to the mic, and uh, if you have a question, don't wait till the person sits down that was up here before you. Just come up and stand behind them, otherwise it'll take too long. So who wants to jump in? Question about any of this, or even if you want to talk theology, that's fine, or apologetics. All right, third question, anyone? Third question. <laughs> come on. Questions, comments. Someone has to have questions. Someone has to disagree. Well, come on up here, sir. No, no, you got to come up to the mic. I'm sorry, because it has to be on the film, and, and people aren't going to see it if, it's, if you're over there, uh, not in front of the mic. So now, now, one person, one brave man. Give this man a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. What's your name, sir? Bob. Say again? Bob. Bob, get a little closer to that mic if you could. Uh, question number three is, um, <laughs> what's your advice about social media, using it, you know, with all the censor, censoring that's happening? Yes, there is censoring going on on social media. It's a good question. In fact, uh, Jorge, why don't you get up to that mic and tell, this guy does great social media work. And uh, so he can tell you exactly what's going on on social media. And... Uh, how we're trying to use social media for good, even though we are getting a bit censored. Go ahead, Ori. All right, you know, it's not a uh, secret that we have a thought police now. We have teams of people censoring several kinds of different topics. Uh, we cannot get off social media. While we still can, we can make a difference. We actually use it all the time, but we do have to build some sort of redundancy and go and look for other alternatives. Now, the problem is that if you completely leave these social media platforms, such, such as uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, even I've seen people doing great work on TikTok and sharing the gospel. Uh, we have a podcast uh, called Dispelling the Myth that arguing on social media is not effective. Uh, we, we did a podcast a few, few months ago. Uh, you have to be there, and you have to be smart about it. Um, you know, the same way that you have to be tactile when you share the gospel with any, anybody else. You don't go guns blazing on a person who don't even give uh, the word of God the place that it deserves. Right? So you have to pick and choose your ba battles as well. Uh, now, there are other, for example, you have a, um, a counterpart to Twitter, which is Parler. Right, uh, but you also don't want to create an echo chamber either. You want to create a place where uh, you can have a back and forth conversation. Now, based on this, 
um, you know that your points are going to be shut down. And that that's going to happen. It's going to come to a point that we're not going to be able to say anything else. But right now, there are a lot of other uh, tech companies creating outlets for us. And we as Christians shouldn't be shutting down the other side either. We shouldn't be creating places where we are just having a one-sided conversation. We should be inviting people. If we want freedom of speech, we should have that. Where both sides can say what they have to say and not just one side. Because if not, we're becoming just the, the, the yin to that yang. Uh, so we have to be present. Now, the other side of this is what is doing to the psychology of our children, right? Social media is eating up their mind if it's not controlled. Uh, social media, they're creating a false sense of value from their social media post to the point where now they're running. A lot of young people, millennials and Gen Zers, are running on what is called this social capital. That if they don't get enough shares, likes, and comments, they don't feel valuable. So you have to let them know that their value is in who they are in Christ. And not it doesn't come from the amount of likes, shares, and follows that they get. Now, that doesn't mean that that's not important for, for somebody like me and Frank on social media. We do want to make sure that we get exposure and we've seen actually our, our analytics show that we're tanking again on Facebook because we're not being uh, pushed in front of more people. So you continue to use them. You see where people, where the, you take the conversation to people until you're shut down. You don't have to walk away from it. You have to use them intelligently. But it is coming and we're going to be censored sooner or later. Hey, what, what is that uh, documentary? Is it called Social Dilemma? Yeah. Is it on Netflix? On Netflix, yeah. Yeah, it's something parents ought to watch, Social Dilemma, yeah. because uh, you, I, it, it's scary what it's doing. It's, it's doing to adults, too. Yeah. yeah. You know? right. Yeah, the question is, should we support companies like right. Facebook and others that may be censoring... Christians, and that's that's a, that that's what we call a Romans 14 issue. That's a matter of conscience right. if you want to do that or not. Uh, so it's up to you whether you want to be a part of that. Right now, we're involved because we want to reach people on those platforms. But as Jorge just said, we're also right now building alternative websites or alternative sites, particularly for YouTube, because we have over 300,000 followers there and. If YouTube shuts down, we have over a thousand videos. If it shuts us down tomorrow, we're going to have another place people can go. Everything is already up and loaded. Yeah, and, and if we are going to consume content, I mean, we want to know what's out there in order to refute it. Uh, but if we were to shut down every it access, our personal access to companies that don't have our best interest in mind, you're going to have to move to an island somewhere because that's exactly where we are right now. Yeah, question, how many people in here are Amazon Prime people? Yeah, you don't like their politics, do you? That's right. But you love their service. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Lori. All right, who else? Dan, the man, what's happening? Hey, Frank, how are you? Go ahead. So you were talking about companies not being able to, they shouldn't be able to exclude Christians or people on the right. Mm-hmm. In my company, in my office, I wouldn't hire a non-believer to come in and work for mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. I have over 200 independent sales organizations, independent contractors. Most of them are not believers. Mm -hmm. They're from all walks of mm -hmm. life. Because I'm not a public company, mm -hmm. when I set up a job interview, if you're not a Christian, I don't want you in my 1,300 mm -hmm. square foot of space. My mm -hmm. COO is my mm -hmm. pastor's brother. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's wrong? No, uh, because, and I think YouTube and Facebook and Instagram have every right to censor Christians. Except, if they want Section 230 protection, they should not censor anyone. But they are. So, I, I agree with you. They should yeah. not have the protection as a media organization. Right. They should not 
be exempt from that. I know that if somebody found out I didn't hire them mm -hmm. because they weren't Christian, I could get sued. Mm -hmm. I'll say it in front of everybody here. I would never let that be the reason. Mm -hmm. My COO knows and we've talked about this. We would never say that is the reason mm -hmm. we're not hiring you because you're a Christian, because you're, you know. And look, I, God gave me an evangelism calling. I particularly have an affinity to give the gospel to gangbangers, gay people. I go out of my way to be nice to transgenders. That doesn't mean I want them, like, spending the night with my children under my roof or in the intimacy of my mm -hmm. non-publicly held company. Am I wrong? No, I don't think so. I think it's America. You have the right to serve who you want to serve, okay? Now, what might happen, because uh, if the left finds out about this, they're going to target you to cancel you, what might happen is they may shut you down anyway. Like, for they example... Can't. I've already been canceled. Yeah, I know. But, for example, <laughs> you may have heard of... Uh, of um, who's Aaron and Melissa Klein out there in, in Oregon. I can't remember the name of their bakery, uh, and the same thing happened to Masterpiece Bakery in uh, Colorado. Let's use Jack Phillips. He's the guy out in Colorado. He said, I will serve anybody that comes through my door, what, regardless of their sexual orientation, but I will not give my talents to do a same-sex wedding. I won't create a, 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 a cake for that. And so some same-sex people came in and said, we want you to do that. And he said, I'm sorry, you can buy a pre-made cake, but I can't use my artistic talents to do that. And so they sued him. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court sided with Phillips, but in a narrow viewpoint. Now, the, Oregon, or the, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission is coming after him again for another reason. Now, here's my question. If you are someone who wants to be married to in a same-sex wedding, or even an opposite sex wedding, do you want anybody at your wedding that disagrees with it? No. no. Then why are you f trying to force this guy? If this is all about love, why are you trying to force this guy to do something his religious convictions and moral convictions tell him he can't do? Because it's not about love. It's right. all about trying to get everybody else to, to see things their way and validate what they want to do. In my industry, I supply money to businesses uh -huh. and IT. I won't supply, and there are lots of outlets that they would do it that I could access. I won't supply money to porn. Good. To anything connected yeah, to that, right? You shouldn't. Technically, they could sue me. Uh huh. I yeah. don't care. Yeah, <laughs> right. right, right. Look, we're coming under attack, right, mm -hmm. in my particular business because the clients that I have. They wouldn't care if I'm, if I'm Christian. I've, I've actually lost a client. I thought I was talking to a conservative in Texas, and I offended them with my conservative viewpoints, and mm. they refused to do business with me, and I lost a lot of money. I don't care. Right, right. It, it, you know, good. but I don't put it on my sleeve like Tom does. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but if you ask me, I'm going to tell you, uh -huh. and I'm not going to back your, your, your belief system and your garbage that goes against my God and his word. Look, another thing, when it, when it comes to who you're going to uh, serve and all that, I think Jack Phillips has the right to say to a same-sex couple, I'm not doing your cake. I also think yeah. if the guy uh, claims to be LGBTQ, he should be able to refuse someone who came in and said, I want you to print up T-shirts that say Leviticus 18, it's an abomination for man to lie with a man. I think that guy has the right to say, no, I'm not doing that either. That's right. He has the right to conscience, just like Jack Phillips does. Right. See, but it only goes one way. Tolerance is a one-way street that's right now in America. That's right. And that's part of the problem. Until Christians start standing up, it's only going to get worse. Live not by lies. Yes, sir. We can't live by lies, ladies and gentlemen. If, if you care about the future of America for your kids, you have to stand up. Yes, sir. I was one of those this morning that said I remembered the day Kennedy was killed. Yes, sir. I also remember lots of things that have happened in America that we are fast losing. I also wore the uniform of the National Guard for 21 years and would gladly serve again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I just I, I, I realize that we're going through some significant changes, primarily because of the ch president. And because the of what? Because of the president. Okay. The president. The current president. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Practically speaking, other than prayer, 
Do you think we got a chance of bringing this country back to where it should be within the region? With God, all things are possible, right? I agree so, with that. So, yes, there is a chance, but only if the church wakes up. As I said earlier, you don't have to convince anybody outside the church to do what's right. If you convince the church to do what's right, problem solved. Okay. Right? Thank you. Thank you for your service, sir. Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes, sir. What's so, your name? So what? What's your name? Sid. Hey, Sid. So what I was going to get to is, yes, the church has pulled back, and, and we've separated ourselves from the secular world, but we just moved here from Washington, and so we're pulling our children out of the public schools because of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So where... Are we doing the wrong thing? That, that's, our children need to be out there, salt and light and everything else, but our children are also our most vulnerable asset mm -hmm. and our most important mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And so where is the line between, as you said, go and preach the gospel and evangelize, be salt and light, and, hey, as a father, I've pushed my kids into a bad fight that they can't win. That is going to be your call dependent on how well prepared your children are. Now... When I, we brought our kids up a generation ago, we homeschooled them through about grade eight, and then we sent them to high school. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, forget the first day that my oldest son came down to go to high school. He had a backpack, and it was full of real heavy books. I'm going, Zach, what do you got in there? And he opened up his backpack, and he had in there the Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics. <laughs> Written by my co-author, Dr. Norman Geisler, said, Zach, why are you bringing that to school? He goes, I might need it. Right? <laughs> so, so he was ready. But each of your kids might be different, and you've got to make that call yourself. Nobody else can tell you what's best for your children. We found out that bringing them up for the first eight grades worked well for us. But I'm getting to the point now where I don't know if I had a kid of college age, I would send him to any college other than maybe a community college. Amen. Because it is, unless you're talking about Liberty or Hillsdale or uh, Houston Baptist or the, the, the handful of schools out there yes, uh, that haven't gone so far left uh, that uh, it, there's no semblance of morality or Christianity on it. So it's going to be your call. Thank you, brother. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, what's your name? Seth. Say again? Seth. Seth, go yes, ahead. Yes, sir. Um, so how would you answer somebody who asks a question about, you know, Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 through 21, where it talks about if a man takes a woman in for marriage and then he, you know, claims that she's not a virgin, and she happens to not be a virgin, then they have the right to take her out and stone her to death. Now, how would you answer somebody, an unbeliever, really, who brings that up, saying, first off, that, you know, how would a God of love approve of that? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it almost seem like God is going against his own words, saying that murder, you know, thou shalt not murder, especially, like, in the New Testament? I mean, it's not... Okay, the first question you want to ask to somebody, first of all, you've got to exegete the text rightly. Yes, I haven't looked at that text in a while, so I don't know if what you said is precisely mm -hmm. the way that text reads. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it for granted it is, yes, okay? Uh, but the first question I'm asking somebody who's not a believer is, by what moral standard would that be wrong? Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, if they're an atheist, they have no moral standard by which to say that's wrong. Okay? Because it presupposes... That there is a right and wrong, which doesn't exist if atheism is true, an objective right and wrong. It presupposes that people are valuable, which isn't true if atheism is true. It presupposes there's a purpose to life, which isn't true if atheism is true, right? It's presupposing so much. So, t so many times when you're answering questions, you have to get behind the assumption or get behind the question to find out what the assumption is and question the assumption. So that would be the first thing I'd ask. Now, it's, it's valid for an atheist to say, okay, I might not have a standard, but you're saying your standard... Uh, is God, the God of the Bible, and you're claiming it's he, that's love, how is that loving? Okay, fair question for an atheist to ask a Christian. And there are several capital crimes in the Old Testament that no longer apply in the New Testament. Why? Because that was a theocracy in ancient Israel, 
And God had to get the promised people in the promised land to bring forth the promised Messiah. And in a theocracy, God is their, is their ruler. And so he had very strict laws to ensure that the bloodline would remain as pure as possible to bring in the, in the Messiah and that Israel wasn't led astray by these other nations. It has to do with the Canaanites and other things, right? Now, if it's really true that what you say is true, it's not murder for God. God can't murder anyone. We can murder people. But when God takes a life, it's not murder. It's judgment, okay? Judgment. Same thing is true with the Canaanites. We don't have the authority to murder people, but God has the authority to take someone's life. In fact, if Christianity is true, people don't really die. They just change location. They go from this life to the next life, and that's up to God when that happens. Now, as I say, I haven't looked at that passage in a while, so I'd have to figure out what's going on there. Uh, the best book on this topic is a book by Paul Copan, and the book is called Is God a Moral Monster? Is God a Moral Monster? So take a look at that book. I'm sure he treats that passage there. Uh, the problem is, is that quite frequently we don't understand the Jewish culture at that time, and we don't understand all the nuances in the text. So we really got to exegete that text closely to figure out what's going on. But those capital crimes no longer exist in the New Testament. They only existed in the Old Testament. Okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you. You guys can stay close. You don't need to hide over there. Yeah, trying to find yes, ma'am. What's your name? To wait. Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hey. Um, I had a question about even with the gender conversation and yeah. how we as Christians can love and spread the gospel to someone who maybe is a transgender person, what, in your opinion, do you think it would be effective to maybe put aside issues like pronouns for the time so that you can get to more of the heart of the issue of who they are in Christ or like who they're a soul in need of salvation? Like putting aside those, um, that discussion of is the pronoun wrong? Maybe using that pronoun they prefer to open up doors relationally. Maybe well, just first of all, that. when you're in someone's presence, you don't need to use pronouns. Fair, just right. like, would you say that maybe those smaller hills to die on might be something to bring up later, but to first address the value of their soul and talking to them? You personally, know, in a way that yeah, opens up ground. yeah. Personally, I don't think so, and okay. here's why. I would explain to the person. I would explain. I would say um, the reason that I can't affirm you in what you want me to affirm you in is because I love you. And I am not going to compromise on that because by affirming what you want to do, first of all, in my view, you are doing something that's impossible. You can't change your sex. It's impossible. You have 40 trillion cells. You're not going to change the DNA. Okay? Uh, secondly, What's most loving is to orient you toward the truth as best as I can, even if you disagree with me. Now, if you do disagree with me, you're implying that there's a standard that I ought to obey, aren't you? That I ought to, I ought to do what you want to do. We appear to be at an impasse here, right? My question is, where does your standard come from? Where you say everyone has to treat me as if I'm a man when I'm really a woman. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's a good thing and a true thing? I think my question may be, be coming from your maybe like Nazi Germany example mm -hmm. where they don't tell the truth in that immediate moment in order to preserve a life. And if uh, that maybe immediate issue of pronouns could, if by putting it aside for the time, could open up a doorway to help preserving someone's soul in that sense. Like um, maybe putting aside those smaller hills to die in. For, not forever saying, you know, that's not true, but putting aside for the time maybe to address something larger and internally more significant. That's, I guess, just something Yeah, to I guess that, that you're gonna, that's a call you're going to have to make, but I really think it's a slippery slope. And I think that if we keep doing that, um, we're eventually going to be compromising on everything. I mean, how can we compromise on something so obvious, right? This is a woman standing before me, not a man. And if I affirm this person going down the road she wants to go in, I'm basically inviting her to a world that has a 19 times percent higher, 19 times higher suicide rate mm. than everybody else. And by the way, the, the research shows that more than 90 percent of young people who have what they think is gender dysphoria grow out of it by the time of their age 18. And so here we are given hormone blockers and trying to change 
their physiology when they're below 18, even now without parental permission, and we are sterilizing these young people for life. And so I think that's such a big deal that I would, I would stand against it. Hmm. And what might be better is to put all the transgender issues aside and just mm -hmm. talk in general about what Jesus came to do to save mm -hmm. us all, right? Because I think we get so wrapped up in like, oh, you think you're a boy when you're not. When yeah. it's like, you're someone who Jesus died for. I want to address that Everybody, yes. Yeah. You can leave all these issues aside and just talk about sin in general. We're all sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what are you going to do with that sin? The Bible says, put it on Jesus. Accept what he's done. If you yeah. don't want to do it, that's fine. God's not going to force anybody into heaven against their will. So. Yeah. Just wanted to address it because it, I feel like sometimes as Christians, we, it's helpful to find ways to love people who we disagree with in an effective way. Besides, I mean, obviously telling them the truth, but in loving them in our discussion and how we relate with yes, them. Yes. Well, so. the demeanor you take is much better than mine. See, I'm from New <laughs> Jersey. You could probably say to somebody anything you wanted to and they'd go, you're wonderful. Right. Well, I, uh, I can't. All, yeah. <laughs> all right. So yeah. I think you you have such a pleasant demeanor that you oh, could you. tell somebody <laughs> that no, you're not a man. You're a woman, and I love you, and I'm not going to call you a man. And they'd go, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, this I'm is Cliff. Cliff. Yes, right. Yeah. Mm. Um, my question is based off of uh, the fact that we often hear once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. But we know the Bible says sexual immorality shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So I wonder, I know we all sin and God looks at our sin. He doesn't look at our sin because we're covered by the blood of Christ. But can you be an active gay Christian is my question. People who say they're actively gay, will they inherit the kingdom of God? And they're, they're claiming to be Christians, and yes. they're engaged in the behavior, and they say that it's a good thing. Right. The closest parallel in Scripture to that is 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul has somebody in the Corinthian church who's sleeping with his father's mother, his stepmother, eventually. And what does Paul say to him? Expel the immoral brother right. so that Satan may correct him, Okay. The, there is, everybody is welcome in the church. There's just one type of person who's not welcome in the church. The person who says he or she is a Christian and that known sin is not sin. And that would be somebody who says, yes, I'm a Christian, but there's nothing wrong with, say, same-sex relationships. That person, according to Paul, should not be permitted in the church. That's right. If the person says, I'm not a Christian, and I think same-sex marriage is okay and same-sex relationships are okay, come on into the church. We hope that maybe what we say here can change your mind. And we're going to love you anyway. But according to Paul, that's pretty tough love. That He says don't even eat with such a one. Right. Why? Because a little bit of yeast leavens the whole loaf. Exactly. Amen. And so the worst thing we can do is affirm people who are going down the wrong road. Just like, in, with, with all good intentions, when you're trying to affirm somebody who's doing the transgender transition, it's good intentions to say, well, I love the person and I want them to feel good, but it doesn't really wind up in a good place. We have to do what's right and leave the results to God in that case. All right, amen. So, thank, thank, you. thank you, Cliff. Nobody said this Christianity stuff was easy, right? Uh, my name is David. Hey, David. And, uh, well, this is really an Internet question. Okay. Everybody says, well, you, you're, for instance, you, uh, we're, we're not going to be a, we're going to set up our own platform on, a, on the Internet. What I don't understand is uh, so many big companies actually run the, the basics for the Internet to keep running throughout the world. So how do you get around that? and still stay on the internet? Um, there are some platforms that are out there. Jorge, you know what those are? Aren't there some? Not, not, not right off the top of my head. Not at the top of your head, but there are platforms that uh, have agreed that they're not going to de-platform people uh, on their websites because there are groups out there that are conservative, say, web hosting companies that at least at this point said that's not going to happen. 
That's about the best we can do at this point. Or you can just open your own and, company. And is growing. <laughs> right? And is growing. You're mm -hmm. going to have email companies. You're going to have web hosting companies. You're going to have even uh, search engines that will not give you just one perspective when you run a search, but it will give you what what is uh, the center position, the left and the right, and then you get to choose. So yeah. that is happening, and there's a lot of people coming together to make this happen. There are. That's what he's saying. You can, you can get up to the mic and say, or right? he just basically said, this is happening around, that companies are coming around to have these search engines and, and web hosting that are not going to de-platform conservatives. It's not going to be overnight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. Yeah, Christians need to do that, right? Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Hi. I'm Stacy. Hey, Stacy. You've covered a lot of great topics that are um, going on all over the country right now, but one that you haven't talked a whole lot about is the critical race theory issues, yes. and that's a big issue going on um, that a lot of people, I don't think, realize how infiltrated that is into the, the children and even corporations and the military and how big of an issue that is becoming, and it's something that I am bold in speaking about but that I also don't feel quite as educated biblically about how to take a stance because I have friends of all races and I totally don't agree with the whole reparations and things like that that right. are trying to be pushed. Um, just, I feel like it need, I need a greater confidence and I don't know where biblically to find that and also um, just your personal tips on how we can be handling and addressing sure. that? Sure. Well, first of all, we have done a lot of uh, work on this on podcasts and in, uh, on our TV show. But let me just say, here's the solution to everything. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, for you are all baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. The only worldview that believes we're all made in the image of God and we're all one is the Christian worldview. As I said earlier, there's only one race, the human race, okay? There are different ethnicities. But let me also point out that we don't know history very well. Um, African Americans, blacks have been treated very poorly in this country for many years, even after the Civil War, as you know. I mean, the Civil War, we got rid of slavery, but we, we ushered in Jim Crow. Do you know that there were white preachers as late as the 50s and 60s, claiming that segregation was a good thing. I mean, really. So this whole critical race theory stuff does not come out of nowhere. All right? Now, critical race theory technically is trying to analyze what things have gotten into our system that may lead to racist outcomes or might be racist themselves. And you know also what was going on in this country as late as the 30s and maybe even a little later than that was redlining. You know what redlining was? Redlining was uh, government saying, drawing lines around neighborhoods so banks wouldn't have to lend money to those minority neighborhoods. And one of the corrective, correctives to that was the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 by Jimmy Carter which ultimately led to other administrations adding to that, which in the 2000s had the government saying, you need to lend money to minorities even if they can't pay it back, which led to the housing bubble and the recession of 2008, 2009, 2010. Do you remember all that? So it was well intended, but it didn't work because you can't lend money to people who can't pay it back without blowing everything else up. So there has been reasons for critical race theory, okay? The problem is, and here is the central problem, I think, with it. Now, it we don't have time to get into all the details, but here it is in one slide. This is what critical race theory buys into, at least partially. That there's a group of people out there called the oppressed and then there are the oppressors. And you can see all the oppressed people on the left and all the oppressors on the right. Now, this is called critical theory. And technically, this is called intersectionality. And what this means is, is that people on the left, if you are, say, black, poor, uh, trans, non-Christian, disabled immigrant, you should be heard 
more than anybody else. If you, on the other hand, are a white, relatively rich man who's a heterosexual Christian, abled citizen, nobody should listen to you. Or you should be listened to less. Where all of these different categories intersect is where your social standing is. Now, some critical race theorists will say this has nothing to do with critical race theory, but yet others will say, no, intersectionality is part of it. So it depends on who you talk to. Okay? This is the problem. Not analyzing whether our systems have racism in them, but treating people by group identity. That's the problem. Because as soon as you treat people by group identity, that's racism or classism or sexism. Martin Luther King said it right. What did he say? He said, I have a dream that one day my four children will be judged not on the basis of the color of their skin, but on the basis of the content of their character. This reverses it. This says, we're going to treat you based on what class you're in, what category you're in. We shouldn't be treating people that way. Now, let me just suggest, I, I've asked a lot of people about this. Stacy, right? Yeah. I've asked a lot of people about, I've asked a lot of people this question. Um, the question is, what laws need to change that are currently racist to fix it? Because if you find any of our laws that are racist, let me be the first person to say, we need to change that. Do you know how much I've heard back on that? One person said we should change drug sentencing laws. Because if you get arrested for crack, you're going to jail longer than if you get arrested for cocaine. Because see, crack is the black drug and cocaine is the white drug, allegedly. But you know why we have different sentencing for those two kinds of drugs? Because the black congressional caucus many years ago said we got to get crack out of our neighborhoods. Let's make the penalty greater. So it wasn't based on racism. It, had to ha it, it, it sort of had a racist outcome, but that wasn't the intent. The intent was to get crack out of black neighborhoods. And so they upped the penalty for it. But it wasn't racist going in. It was the black congressional caucus asking for it. And bet you won't, you won't hear people talking about that. Here are three things, four things, that I think we can do to improve outcomes for minorities, okay? Number one, the absolute number one thing we ought to do is we ought to protect life. Do you know that blacks make up 12% of the population in America but account for 38% of the abortions? In fact, in 2011, more blacks were killed by abortion than were killed by all other forms of death combined. More babies in New York City are, are, more black babies are aborted than are born. We need to protect life, number one. Number two, school choice. Why should a white, rich person in a particular neighborhood have the, if we're talking about public education, have the right to go to a good school, but a poor minority kid in a bad neighborhood doesn't have that same right. We should have school choice. By the way, that was put in in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, before President Obama came into office, and it helped minority kids, like 1,500 minority kids, go to better schools, and Obama wanted to get rid of it. Why? Teachers' unions. Because if you give school choice, what's that going to mean? That means teachers are going to have to compete with one another for the better students and for their own jobs. Monopolies always lead to inefficient outcomes. Choice leads to better outcomes, but nobody wants choice. Welfare to work. President Clinton went from welfare to work. It helped the welfare situation. It was reversed by President Obama, unfortunately. Now we're paying minorities, and whites too, to have children out of wedlock. That's the biggest disaster we have. And the fourth suggestion is housing incentive zones. We have this going on in Charlotte now. I have people, friends of mine, who are investing in housing for minorities that they don't have to pay taxes on for five years. So that would help as well. But I submit to you, 
I'm just going to tell you the truth here. Sorry if you don't like it. The Democrat Party is against every one of these things. The Republican Party is for it. Who wants to help minorities? Unfortunately, there are too many sissy Dem uh, Republicans out there that won't really stand either. But in the platform of those two parties, you're going to find this in the Republican Party. You're not going to find exactly the opposite in the Democrat Party. And these are the people rightfully complaining there are inequities. By the way, if you're annoyed that a white guy is talking about race, you've bought into critical race theory. You're saying only certain people can talk about this. You just bought into the whole thing. Or at least you bought into intersectionality. That you got to be of a certain... Isn't that the whole point? That we're all human beings and we ought to all respect one another regardless of what, how much pigment we have in our skin? Isn't that the point? So, Stacey, if you want to read more about critical race theory and critical theory in general, because it's not just critical race theory, it's critical queer theory, there's, you know. Um, Neil Shenvey, who writes at Neil Shenvey Apologetics, Neil, N-E-I-L-S-H-E-N-V-I. Shenvey has researched this a lot and has written on it. He has his critics. There are people that don't always agree with him, but I think he's pretty fair with who he reads on this. And one of the problems, in my view, is this. And that is, hang on a second, if we are going to be teaching this, if critical race theory brings this along with it, we can't be teaching this. We can't be teaching people to treat one another based on the class or skin color. Or, no. But that's what it does. So check out neilshenvey.com. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir, go ahead. Um, What's so your name? My name's Evan. Hey, Evan, yeah. Um, I'm actually going to ask a question that's based off of what Mr. Cliff said. He was talking about Christians who claim to be gay and engaging in that behavior. Yeah. What do you have to say about, like, Christ people who claim to be Christian but are engaging in, like... Fornication. Yeah, like sexual Same thing. marriage, yeah. Same thing. They're claiming there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I feel like it's a little bit hypocritical for people to be indulging in that, but yes. then calling out some other people. And I just, I was hoping that you touch on it, so I wouldn't have to come. Yeah, to no, mind, I agree know, with but, you. <laughs> but you did, I agree so with I you. Like, no, you know, I wanna... let me say, if people are engaged in any sexual activity outside of the marriage of a man and a woman, the Bible says no, and for good reason. You see, this is the problem. We think God has put guardrails around us to somehow cramp our style, yeah. when in fact the guardrails are there to protect us. In fact, let me ask you guys a question. How many in here have ever bought a new car, right? You buy a new car, it comes with a manual, right? And the manual says, do this, but don't do this, right? Do this if you want to protect the car. Don't do this if you want to hurt the car or others. Do we get mad at Hyundai or Ford or Chevy or whoever when they say, don't do this? No. The designer of the car should know what not to do, right? Why do we get mad at God when he sends down his manual and, and he says, don't do this if you want to live a fruitful life? Why do we get mad at that? Because it's not what we want. That's not what we want, yeah. yeah. And so the problem is, is we don't want to submit our will to his will. We want to do our own thing. And look, we all do, right? None of us live this out perfectly. Of course not. So I think that we have to try and show people that these moral commands are put in place for our own good. They're not there because God is a cosmic killjoy. It's exactly the opposite. In fact, you know that all freedom requires restraint? If you want to, like tonight, i got to drive to Charlotte. I'll be free to drive to Charlotte if I stay between the lines, the restraints of the lines. If I start going outside the lines, into the shoulder, across people's lawns, I'm not going to make it, right? <laughs> freedom requires restraint. If you want the freedom to have a relationship, a loving relationship with another human being, you've got to forsake all others. You've got to restrain yourself from dating other people. You know, when I got married, that really put a cramp on my dating life. It, <laughs> it restrained me, but for good reason. If you want to have good health, you have to restrain yourself from eating anything and everything, right? Restraints are a good thing, but restraints are there to give you freedom in other areas. If you don't restrain yourself, there's going to be trouble. And C.S. Lewis famously said, for any kind of success in this world, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary. 
fact, let me say one other thing about this. Now I'm preaching, okay? Um, you know, one of the most important verses in the entire Bible is a proverb. Proverbs 4.23, which says, Above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. What does our culture say? Exactly the opposite. Follow your heart. Brook every stream. Swim every river. Climb every mountain. Whatever your heart tells you to do, do it. Let me tell you, that is a disaster. If you followed your heart every time, you'd be dead already. You can't follow your heart every time. Why? Because, first of all, your heart's going to want to do something you ought not want to do. Secondly, your heart changes. You notice that? When you get older.